Hey guys welcome back to our channel. So in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto was killed by villager and reborn as fully potential dragon. This is part 1, and if you want more of this, then please leave a like share and subscribe, and please don't forget to check it our author of this fanfic, link her details in description, so go and check it out. Let's get in the video. Life sucks. These words can be taken up by one Naruto Uzumaki, as he fraud against his best friend at the valley of the end. Naruto's life had pretty much sucked ever since he was born. When he was born a massive nine-tailed fox attacked and was sealed inside his stomach by the fourth Hokage. Sadly, the villagers needed something to vent their anger on. The result was Naruto's tortured childhood. He was given overpriced rotten food to eat, had little to no friends, and was treated like a leper. There were days, specifically his birthday, when people got rowdy. That tends to happen when people get drunk. Thankfully, at that point, Naruto was pretty good at hiding. In the Ninja Academy Naruto's life didn't improve. He made little to no friends because of his status as a pariah. On top of that the many teachers would sabotage his work, so he became known as the class idiot and was the dead last of his year. While some teachers didn't sabotage him the Jinchuriki thing did work against him by giving him more chakra than the average genin at his age. As a result, Naruto had trouble doing simple techniques like clones, substitutions, and transformations. As a result, he was labeled a lost cause since the teachers didn't want to put in the extra work. Naruto also had to play the part of an idiot because it helped keep the villagers off his back, especially the shinobi. Naruto had contemplated leaving, but he couldn't. He had nowhere to go. He had no family to speak of, alive or dead, and he had a feeling that once he stepped foot outside the village, without a guide, there would be a massive fox hunt. He managed to graduate, after three failures, by mastering an air rank technique called the Shadow Clones, which he could use with extreme ease and beat the tar out of a traitor to the village. After graduating he was put with the Rookie of the Year, Sasuke Ichiha, and his number one fangirl, Sakura Haruno. Their sensei was Kakashi Haddock, a perverted jonin who spent most of his time reading smut. Their first test resulted in Naruto being tied to a post, even though Sakura did nothing the entire test but hide. Right away Naruto realized Kakashi was just like the rest of the villagers. He hated him for the QB and did his best to sabotage Naruto by refusing to train him. He focused all his time on Sasuke training the arrogant emo prince. He did the same in the Chuanin exams, saying Sasuke needed him more because he was fighting a psychopath named Gara. Naruto in the meantime had to fight Niji Hayuga, who had no problems nearly killing his own cousin. With the help of the self-proclaimed super pervert, Jurei and Naruto learned summoning. He beat Niji and would later beat Gara by summoning the toad boss, Gamabunta. Later, Naruto would learn another air rank technique called the Rasengan and save the life of one Tsunade Senju, who was going to be the fifth Hokage. Despite all this nothing changed. The villagers all passed on Naruto's accomplishments to Sasuke because they didn't want to believe that the demon could actually do something incredible. Now, Sasuke, who believed Konoha was holding him back, had decided to ditch the village for Orochimaru, one of the village's greatest traitors. Naruto and some of the other rookies, Shikamaru, Chajui, Kiba and Akamaru and Niji, had all been chosen to retrieve him. The team had beaten all their opponents with the help of three Suna Shinobi. Now Naruto stood off against his fellow genin in a fight that would decide. Sasuke had activated a curse seal he had on his neck and had gone into a second state that turned his skin gray, his hair purple, gave him a black mark on the bridge of his nose and turned the sclera of his eyes black. Naruto was currently wrapped up in a cloak given by the use of the QB's chakra. He had a large fox tail and two large fox-like ears on his head formed by the cloak. The two glared at each other across the way of the two statues of the Valley of the End. Naruto formed a large spiraling ball of chakra in on hand while Sasuke gripped what like a ball of lightning. The two launched at each other. Rasengan. Hidori. The two clashed with a loud bang. A massive black orb formed in the middle of the waterfall and there was a loud explosion. When the smoke faded it showed Naruto and Sasuke lying down on the ground. Obviously, the fight had taken a lot out of them. Meanwhile a man in Jonin attire with gravity-defying silver hair, a headband slanted over one eye and a face mask saw the whole thing. With him was a mall brown pug that had a darker brown snout, ears, he had a blue vest that had a seal on the back, and a headband like Naruto's and the silver-haired man. Well, what do you know? The pug said in a deep gruff voice that was very deceptive for his cute appearance, the kid actually won. Well, it looks like you won't need me anymore Kakashi. See you later. The pug vanished in a puff of smoke. Bakashi stood up and clenched his fist. He had seen the jutsu Naruto had used. How dare the dead last use one of the two judas that the yandame, his sensei used. How dare this demon pervert one of the jutsu that made his sensei famous. Bakashi walked forward and leaned down next to Sasuke and began to heal him using a medical jutsu that he had copied. After a moment Sasuke began to stir. 
Sazuke rose up with a pained look on his face. What happened? The Ichiha asked. Then he remembered and turned to glare at the unconscious blonde next to him. Easy Sasuke, Kakashi said, as he walked towards Naruto and started to pick him up. The movement woke Naruto who stirred slightly. Eh sensei? Naruto asked, as he saw the familiar hair, W what are you doing? Kakashi answered, this is for the best Naruto. Sasuke is going to kill you and rid the world of the QB. At the same time. He is going to gain the next phase of his Sharingan, the Manjekyo, and return to Konoha. Naruto's eyes widened, you can't be serious. Kakashi simply lifted Naruto up and said, oh, I am. And I'm sure the Godin will give him some leeway when she hears of how he had to kill you because you had lost control of the QB's chakra and went on a rampage. Naruto tried to get away from Kakashi, only to feel a seal get pressed onto his back. He could feel the QB's chakra stop healing him and the pain returned from his shoulder wound. Sasuke, having heard Kakashi's words, smirked. With this he would be able to get one step closer to avenging his clan. Not only that, but he couldn't let it get out that the dead last had defeated him. Naruto was at the bottom of the totem pole for a reason. The sound of chirping birds reached Naruto's ears as he saw the Chidori active on Sasuke's hand. The Ichiha had that same infuriating smirk on his face. You should be happy though, Sasuke said, with your death, you will be helping me get one step closer to being able to kill my brother. You should be glad you'll be of use to a great clan such as mine. But that Sasuke pulled the attack back and shoved it through Naruto's chest. The whiskered blonde coughed up blood as the attack shredded his lung and nicked his heart, causing it to bleed. Sasuke had a triumphant grin on his face. It fell when he realized something. He didn't feel any stronger. He didn't feel any rush of strength, nor did his Sharingan feel changed. What happened? He was supposed to get stronger with Naruto's death. That's what Kakashi just said. Naruto's pain chuckling reached his ears. Sasuke glared at Naruto who was just laughing. You actually think I thought you were my friend? Naruto rasped, an arrogant prick like you? I tolerated you Sasuke. When I'm dead you'll gain nothing. You lose. He then turned to Kakashi and said, Congrats, Sensei. It looks like you are just as much trash as this duck-haired bastard. When you die I'll be waiting. But that last word, and a smirk that infuriated Kakashi, the light left Naruto's eyes. The young ninja had died. Sasuke growled in anger as he was denied the power he so rightly deserved. It was necessary to end his brother and finally avenge his clan. The boy went through hand signs and yelled, fire release. Great fireball technique. Sasuke only released a few sparks as he found that he had too little chakra left after the battle. The strain of using the level 2 curse seal hitting him like a runaway cabbage cart. The boy then pitched over and fell right next to the now dead blonde. Bakashi sighed as he reached into his pocket and pulled out a blank scroll. He removed the suppression seal he placed on high before sealing away Naruto's body in it and sheathed it on his belt. While he hated doing so, he didn't want to risk Orochimaru getting his scaly mitts on Naruto's body, especially if any of the QB's chakra was still left in Naruto's body. He then picked up Sasuke and headed back to Konoha. He looked up as clouds began to gather in the sky before rain began to fall. Kakashi looked up, believing that the heavens were crying with joy at the destruction of the nine-tailed beast. Finally, you can rest in peace and say. Unknowingly, Kakashi and Sasuke's actions had just started Konoha's death clock. In a high plane of existence. Bam, that silver-haired bastard. The image of Naruto being killed and burned was seen in a mirror. The mirror was on the wall of a very extravagant-looking room. In the room were several individuals. The one who yelled was a woman with long red hair and purple eyes wearing Jonin garb. Though you couldn't tell her eyes were purple because she had an epic scary face on as she radiated crimson energy, while her hair waved around like octopus tentacles, her face completely shadowed with only round white circles in place of her eyes. The second was a man with spiky blonde hair with two long sideburns running down the sides of his face. He wore a jonin like attire under a long white trench coat with the words yellow flash written on the back with red flames imprinted on the bottom. The third was a man long brown hair cut short on top with two locks wrapped in bandages framing either side of his face. His eyebrows were cut short and his eyes had blue marking around them, which were turned up in the corners. He wore a high-collared, light-colored kimono held closed by a dark sash. On the collar were several magatama decorating it. Under the kimono was a full-bodied suit. The fourth had short spiky brown hair with two locks wrapped in bandages and framing either side of his face. He wore a headband with a metal plate, replacing the ninja headband only without the symbol. He wore the same outfit as the other man. The fifth was a tall and pale-skinned man with deep wrinkles. He had spiky, shoulder-length pale red hair with a chin-length braid hanging fin front of his left ear. He had a long beard. He also had two horn-like protrusions on his head. He had purple eyes with a black dot as a pupil and ring-like pattern around it and a red marking that in the middle of his forehead. 
if you looked at his palms you would see a light colored circle on his right palm and a dark colored moon on his left. A six was a tall man with featureless wide eyes and horn-like protrusions on his forehead. He had no eyebrows and long light colored hair with bangs combed to the left and a single chin length lock that hung from the right side of his face. He wore a light full length kimono with a pattern of six black magatama around the collar and dark pants. He had a sword strapped to his left hip and a dark crescent moon on his left palm. In order they were Kashina Yuzumaki Namikas, Minato Namikas, Indra Atsutsuki, Asura Atsutsuki, Hagoromo Atsutsuki, and Himura Atsutsuki. As mad as they were there were three people who seemed angrier. The first was a woman with beautiful tan skin. Her tan skin was a contrast to her long snow white hair. Her golden eyes were filled with anger. Her curvaceous body was covered by a pure white battle dress with a window cut out that showed off some of her chest and cleavage. Her dress ran down to her ankles, her feet were covered with white boots that went up to her calves. The second was just as curvy as the first. In contrast her skin was pale and hair was pitch black and done up in pigtails. She had bright purple eyes. Her attire consisted of a black corset with dark purple highlights down the center. Her lower half was covered by a skirt that went to her knees and was a little loose. Her feet were covered with black boots. In her hands was a black staff with a large double-bladed scythe that had the kanji for hell on one end and the kanji for heaven on the other. The third woman was also curvy. She had short green hair that went down to her neck. Her eyes were a deep brown color. She wore a deep green top that revealed her cleavage in her midriff. Lower half was covered by tight pants and what looked like hiking boots. Over her top was a brown leather jacket that had the image of vines wrapping around her arms. In order they were Kami, Shinigami, and Tozi. I am humans, Shinigami said, do they really believe that Naruto is a demon? Do they have such little faith in their leader and my power? Kami reached out and said, calm down sis. There is no need to go crazy. At least not yet. Tozi nodded and said, yes there are other matters we must focus on. I told you that you shouldn't have sealed the fox into Naruto. I told you. The three goddesses turned to see Kashina was tearing into Minato furiously, even though she had been doing so since the day that they died. I know. I know. I screwed up. Minato yelled back at his wife, don't you think I feel bad enough about what has happened to our child? Kashina yelled, no. Agoromo shook his head and asked, how far the world has fallen. If Tabarama and Hashirama were here no doubt they would weep at how far their beloved village has fallen. Amura nodded and said, I must agree brother. The ninja world has fallen into chaos because of the gift given to them. Asura crossed his arms and said, it is truly heart-wrenching to see my reincarnation put through such pain. Indra nodded and said, yes, and mine has become so horrible. At least after my defeat I began to mellow out. Ami walked forward and said, all right, I believe we are all in agreement. Everyone looked at the goddess and nodded. Kami reached out and snapped her fingers. Ashes began to form and rose from the ground. They began to mix together in a small twister before growing bigger and forming a skeleton. After a few more moments muscle and sinew began to form and then skin. Orange cloth began weaving into existence on the body. In a matter of minutes Naruto was back and alive. Huh? What the hell? Naruto looked at his hands, shocked to be alive. The next thing Naruto knew he was enveloped by a powerful hug and being squeezed like crazy. All Naruto could tell was a lot of red color. Oh, Sachi. I missed you so much. Naruto then pushed away from the powerful hug, despite the woman's bizarre strength. Naruto stepped back away from the duo. Then he saw him. The blonde-haired man behind her. Ah uh, hi. Minato said awkwardly. Naruto's look became angry. You. The next thing the dead Kage knew he was tackled to the ground. Before he could gain his bearings he found himself being beaten in the face by Naruto furiously. You bastard. Do you have any idea what you put me through? Do you have any idea the suffering I had to endure because of you? Why did you choose me? Why? Kashina managed to pull the boy off her husband. Naruto was now thrashing around in her arms. Minato got up off the ground and said, okay, I deserve that. Naruto writhed in Kashina's arms. Tears of anger were running down his cheeks. He stopped and just started crying. Why did you pick me? Naruto asked. The older blonde answered, because you're my son. Naruto froze. There was a brief silence. Kashina let her son go. Minato approached slowly. Naruto then threw out a leg and kicked the man between the legs. Minato let out a cry of pain as he fell to his knees clutching his injured body. The other guys in the room all winced at the strike to the balls. Kashina then wrapped the blonde around the boy's shoulders and hugged him tightly. Does that mean you're my mom? Naruto asked. The red-haired Kinoichi smiled and said, yep, Kashina Yuzumaki. The red hot-blooded habanero and second Jinchuriki of the QB, Databane. Naruto blinked and laughed and said, wow. Now I know where I get my verbal tick, Databeo. 
the older Yuzumaki giggled cutely. As she snuggled Naruto tightly, like she had hoped to do when he was a toddler. She then made the mistake of rubbing Naruto's cheek. Naruto purred. Kishina pulled back in shock as Naruto looked very embarrassed. She was then hugged him squealing, cute. Naruto continued to purr in his mother's embrace, though he tried to get out of it, but it was very difficult given Kishina's incredible strength. The three goddesses smiled and Kami said, as much as I hate to break up the touching family moment we have business to get to. The young ninja looked up at the three women and blushed slightly at how pretty they were. Naruto, Kishina said, may I introduce, Kami, Shinigami, and Tozi, the three goddesses, and the Atsutsuki family, the family of the Sage of Six Paths. Naruto looked at his mother then the three goddesses and the people who started the ninja world, not that he knew that last one of course. Naruto looked at them briefly brining in their features as he realized that they were not only telling the truth, but he could feel the incredible power coming off them. He could have sworn he heard a voice in his head say, holy shit, but he pushed that aside. Naruto blinked in shock before finally bowing deeply to the three goddesses. Naruto wasn't that big on manner or tact, but even he knew that you shouldn't mess with divine beings. Ami smiled and said, there is no need to bow before us Naruto. We have brought you here for a reason. Naruto answered, what? What reason do you have to talk to me about? Ami answered, the world the world has become a dark and desecrated place. The gift of chakra given by the sage of six paths has been abused over the years. Even the person who was supposed to have the power of the six paths has been corrupted. We want you to bring peace to the world. Naruto blinked and said, peace. What are you talking about? Wait, aren't you three our goddesses? Can't you do something? Those he spoke up and said, unfortunately, ancient laws passed by creatures older than us prevent us from involving ourselves in the world of mortals. We are however, able to choose champions to fight for us on the mortal plane. Shinigami nodded and said, yeah, you are the only one. There is another person from your village who has caught the attention of a few of our siblings. I believe his name was Itachi. Naruto's eyes widened at the name of the Akatsuki member who he had seen before. He flinched slightly as he remembered the cold, emotionless eyes that the Ichiha clan murder. Are you crazy Naruto yelled, I may have a grudge against Sasuke but Itachi, that guy murdered his entire clan on a whim. Why the hell would he do that? Ami stepped back, surprised at the boy's words. Then she held out her hand. A portal appeared in front of them. Curious, Naruto approached the portal and was surprised to see a conversation between the Sandame and a younger Itachi. He heard them speak about how the Ichiha clan was planning a coup. How Itachi had been forced to choose to kill them to prevent it. He could see the regret in Itachi's eyes as he was given the order. Afterwards, it showed Itachi being inducted into the Akatsuki. He saw the tears of anger running down his cheeks and his wail of absolute sorrow. Naruto blinked in shock. He had no idea. It also meant that Sasuke wasn't even fighting for the right reason. His thoughts turned dark as his mind went back to Kakashi and Sasuke for what they did to him. Killing him for power and doing so because of some stupid old grudge. It also made Naruto wonder what would happen if Sasuke ever found out the truth. Naruto was brought out of his thoughts when Kami spoke. There is more than just that, Naruto, Tozi said, the man you called a grandfather is not the man you knew him to be. Naruto looked at the nature goddess with a confused expression. What do you mean? The old man was always there to help me when I needed it. Ami waved her hand again and there was another image shown. It showed the old man talking with his advisors, two people whom the blonde knew hated him. They seemed to be talking about how they should have Naruto as a weapon for their village, nothing new to most. What shocked Naruto telling them that he agreed. How he told everyone in the village his status, because he knew that they would react badly to this information. Ordering certain Anbu to make sure Naruto would be caught in certain bad situations, and others to save him. Also he would have a reason to have some connection to the village. If that wasn't enough to hurt Naruto's image of the old leader, the image rewound a few years to show the four meeting again and planning the downfall of a country called Yuzushio. He saw the younger Sirotobi give orders to sabotage the seals protecting the village and ignore all calls for help. He saw the village fall, with his mother being led to Konoha. The image then began to fast forward showing a younger Naruto having special seals placed on his body that would further cripple him, all provided by the bandaged old advisor, Danzo, if he heard right, only to have the seals be burned off by the QB's influence. The elder ninja present looked upset at the new information, especially Kashina, as displayed by her hair rising and waving around like the tails of a certain giant fox. The Atsutsuki siblings looked upset as well. He was shocked to find out that this was to bring the QB to Konoha, so they would have a weapon against the other villages. Naruto fell to his knees in shock. His grandfather figure, the man who laughed at his pranks and welcomed him into his life with open arms was a fraud. He didn't see him as a monster, but he only saw him as a weapon and a tool. Naruto felt like his world had just shattered. The trio gave Naruto a couple of moments to get his head together. 
Like we said, the world is corrupt. There are other examples, such as your treatment as a child. The bloodline massacre in Kiri, the abuse of the Biju to create the Jinchuriki and their abuse. We want this to end. We want to bring true peace to the elemental nations. Naruto blinked in shock. What did you mean by bring peace? What do you want me to do? Hami smiled and said, we will bless you with power from all three of us. We have also found someone to teach you. And I mean really teach you, not like the lazy cyclops or that perverted hermit. Someone to bring you real power. Naruto blinked in surprise. What do you get in return? Naruto asked, I highly doubt that such a great honor would come without a cost. The three grinned as they looked at each other. Those he said, simple boy. First, we want you to destroy Konoha. That village has become a corrupt shadow of its former self. Not just the village, but others who believe themselves above the laws of nature and to be gods in human skin. Naruto's thoughts went to Orochimaru when he heard that remark. The goddess of light answered, the world has become a shadow of its former self. Your ancestor, the sage of six paths, gave chakra to the world in hopes that it would help the world. Instead it has led to a war-stricken world. For you to complete this mission Naruto, you must bring peace to the elemental nations. Naruto's eyes widened slightly. He was wondering why they were giving him this mission. Naruto is honored, Buddha was also nervous as this was a very tall order. Naruto was quiet as he thought, which brought slightly concerned looks from those around him. Naruto then pushed aside his doubts. If they believed that he could do it, then he would give it his all. A steely reserve formed in the boy's eyes. So, what do you think of our offer? Shinigami asked, are you willing to accept the job? Naruto was quiet for a minute. Then he said, yeah, on one condition. I get to wipe out Konoha. It's high time that village got what was coming to it. The three nodded. Kishina and Minato looked at each other. Kishina was happy her son decided to join them and bring down that corrupt village. If not just for his own revenge, but for what they did to his home country and his people. Minato looked upset slightly at his old village, but he quickly squashed the feeling. Kami stepped forward and said, as Kami I bless you with my power over light. You can heal any wound, physical and mental, revive the dead. She leaned down and kissed his left cheek, causing him to blush and leaving a white lipstick mark. Shinigami stepped forward and said, as Shinigami I bless you with the power over darkness. You can cause any injury, manipulate the darkness. She leaned down and kissed the boy's right cheek, leaving a purple lipstick mark. Tozi then said, as Tozi I bless you with the power over nature. You can freely communicate with animals of all kinds, and I give you knowledge of every jutsu on earth. She leaned down and kissed his forehead, leaving a green lipstick mark. The three marks then glowed brightly as they faded. Naruto then felt a huge rush of power run through his body. Naruto groaned in pain before taking a few steps back and rubbed his head. Oh man, the blonde boy said, I feel like I just chugged down a huge barrel of energy drinks. Ashina said, come on now Gaki. We can start your training tomorrow. For now, though, I'd like to catch up with my son, and I think you'd like to meet your other teachers. But that the Yuzumaki Namaka's clan members and the Akatsuki clan members began to leave. The three goddesses just stood there and watched. So that's him, huh? The three goddesses turned to see two new figures entered the room. They were a man and woman. The man was rather tall, standing over six feet, nearly seven feet. His body was covered with muscle showing he was built for both speed and power. His skin was tanned. He wore a black lined gold vest with a white shirt with a long pair of black pants and combat boots. There were black arm guards on his forearms. The man's eyes were gold and reptilian-like, and on his bared upper arms were patches of what looked like lizard scales. The woman looked incredibly young. She had long, wavy blonde hair that reached down to her feet with a single lock pointed upwards, large green eyes that didn't have under eyes, and her build was childlike. She wore a frilly pink layered robe with a red ribbon tied in a bow around her neck. Around the chest were three diamond patterns with two blue triangles above. Each of these series were outlined in hot pink. On her head were wing-like adornments around her ears and small hoop earrings. She also lacked shoes. Ami smiled and said, yes that is the child of prophecy we told you about. The man scoffed and said, the little runt didn't seem like much. The woman elbowed the man in the gut and said, oh, quite Bahamut. You can see if he is worthy. Give the kid some time to relax and rest. Besides if I remember correctly you value family. Isn't that why you called the dragons back in earthen land? Ahmed muttered something under his breath and said, be quiet Mavis. The now identified Mavis giggled and said, so when will he go to my world? I'd like to see his face when he learns about magic. Ami answered, eventually. I want him to gain good control of his powers before he starts learning from you Bahamut no offense. Bahamut shrugged and said, I understand. My methods can be brutal. But that the five figures began to walk away from each other. Meanwhile. On a large mountain filled with toads a certain one shifted. 
The toad was incredibly large, easily eclipsing a building. He was brown colored with a white belly. He was incredibly wrinkles, and his eyes were squinting. He wore a professor's hat with tassels and an orb on top of it. Around its neck was a necklace that had the kanji for oil on it. This was Gamamaru, the great toad sage. There were walls lined with scrolls all around this toad. The toad shifted as he felt something off he reached out with a webbed hand. He pulled the scroll from the wall and opened it. His squinted eyes widened as he saw the words on the scroll be rewritten. Amamaru wheezed slightly and said, the prophecy has changed. The village of Kanahagakur stood by the gates with bated breath. Some were waiting for the return of Saz Keicheha, the last remaining member of one of their strongest clans. Many of the village had been trying to pamper Sasuke, so he would see them in a favorable light, and when he rose to the title of clan head, he would repay them. Girls were after him because they believed that one day they would marry Sasuke and live the easy life, as they would have a very prominent name. Two such individuals were Ino Yamanaka and Sakura Haruno, two diehard Sasuke fangirls. There were others who were waiting for Naruto to return. The first was Hinata Hayuga. A girl who had a huge crush on Naruto since the academy. The second was Tsunade Senju the fifth Hokage and Naruto's godmother. The third was Shizune, Tsunade's assistant. The others waiting for the boy were Gara, Tamari, and Kankuro, who had been called in on the mission as backup. Where are they? Sakura asked that Baka had better keep his promise. Ino nodded and said, yeah. If he has done anything to Sasuke, I'll tear his mind apart. Off to the side Hinata gave a soft glare at the two. The two were so focused on Sasuke that they didn't seem to care about anything else. Ino should be seeing her two teammates in the hospital. Instead she was here worried about her crush. Hinata then felt a small amount of shame run through her. She was just as bad as she couldn't even focus on her own training. Pretty soon people started muttering as they saw Kakashi approaching with Sasuke in his arms without Naruto. Get him to the hospital, Kakashi said, as Anbu approached. They took Sasuke and ran to the hospital. Ino and Sakura quickly ran after the Anbu, hoping to see their crush. Tsunade approached Kakashi, a frightened expression on her face. Kakashi where is Naruto? Tsunade asked, where is he dammit? Bakashi, harnessing his acting skills, said, I'm sorry Tsunade-sama, but I didn't reach them in time. Sasuke had driven Naruto through with a Chidori. Naruto was dead when I got to them. The bus Tikage gained a panicked expression as she said, no it can't be. The drive the point home, Kakshi pulled out the scroll with Naruto's body in it. Tsunade took the scroll with trembling hands. She knew these kinds of scrolls all too well. She knew that as these were used in times of war to ship the dead back home, to prevent secrets from being found or for the dead being desecrated. The blonde closed her eyes as tears began to form. Tsunade found herself clenching her fist as she remembered the deaths of Dan and Nawaki, both killed by the curse of her necklace. At that moment she turned and left, heading for the Kage Tower in the middle of the village. Shizun quickly ran after her teacher, hoping to comfort her. Anada was taking it as badly as Tswand. She proceeded to go home so no one would have to see her cry. Other villagers began acting more jovial when they learned that Sasuke had killed Naruto. Finally, the demon they had all despised was dead. They no longer had to fear the retribution of the QB. They all began to vocalize their joy. Ara and his siblings felt disgust and sorrow build up. Sorrow for the loss of the boy who had helped to make their damaged family whole again, after their father turned Gara into a virtually emotionless fighting machine. Anger at the villagers for their disregard for the death of someone over something that they had no control over. Beyond that was disgust towards these people for celebrating the return of a traitor. Had it been their village, Sasuke would have dragged Sasuke back in chains and then had him tried for what he did. However, it seemed that they didn't seem to care. The trio of sand ninja began to leave, heading back home. They would make sure that the wind daimyo would know of how their so-called ally treated their own. Meanwhile on Mount Mayaboku. What do you mean the prophecy has changed? The shout came from Jiraiya, the toad sage, echoed throughout the chamber Gamamaru was in. Yes, the great toad sage said, the prophecy has changed. It doesn't refer to a child anymore. Now it refers the spawn of a dragon who will bring peace or destruction of the world. It says that with the power of the heavens and with golden fire, he will eviscerate all evil, with the help of the nine keys. Dureya looked confused at this. What the hell did this prophecy mean? Why do prophecies always have to be so damn cryptic? He didn't know what the heavens meant. Could it mean the sage of six paths, or something else? The gold fire was probably a bloodline or some ability he had. As for the nine keys, he immediately thought about the tailed beasts. He idly wondered what this would mean for Naruto. Ureya. The white-haired super pervert turned to see a toad that far eclipsed his own size, but not as big as Gamamaru. The toad was orange with blue markings. Bandages were wrapped around his body and left foreleg. 
He had a necklace with seven large beads on with, with the central and largest one had the kanji for loyalty on it. It was Gama, the holder of the toad summoning Conrad. What is it Gama? What's got your armor in a wad? Jiraiya asked, confused. Instead of answering the toad took out the summoning scroll. He laid it down and opened it. Jiraiya looked down at the open scrolls. He was curious and when he caught sight of Naruto's name. The name that was normally written in red blood had turned black, signifying Naruto's death. Oh no, Jiraiya said, I have to go Gamamaru, tell Ma and Pato I say hi. But that Jiraiya vanished in a plume of smoke. Moments later in Konoha. Jiraiya appeared in a large blast of smoke. He was treated to the sight of Tsunade chugging down a huge bottle of sake. While this did result in his favorite parts of her moving in a nice fashion, he also knew that Tsunade only drank like this when she was grieving, as he saw her do it when Dan and the Waki died. Tsunade, Jiraiya said getting the woman's attention, is it true? Is Naruto really gone? Tears spilled down the woman's face, and that was the only answer that the old pervert needed. Jiraiya swept her up in a hug and held her tight, hoping to comfort his oldest friend. Why? She asked, why does that damn thing keep taking everybody away from me? Tsunade sobbed as he continued to hug Jiraiya. She was also trying to keep aware of where his hands were. Luckily, they stayed on her back. It's okay, Haim, Jiraiya whispered, let it out. Let it all out. She did. All the pain she had bottled up over her brother, Nawaki, her lover, Dan, and now her godson, Naruto. Tsunade sobbed into her fellow Sanin's shoulder. This is all my fault, Tsunade sobbed, I shouldn't have left. I was so upset over Kashina, I didn't even think of coming back. Jiraiya said, it's my fault too. I should have checked on Naruto when I came to give Sirotobi sensei my updates. I should have been a better godfather. Now I know when I die, Kashina, Minato, and probably Naruto are going to kick my ass into reincarnation. The spider upset nature Tsunade couldn't help but chuckle. The image of the three family members beating the living the tar of the old pervert brought her spirits up some. The pair backed off from each other. There was a brief silence. I'm leaving. Jiraiya turned to Tsunade with a shocked expression. What? The busty blonde sighed and said, I'm leaving. I don't have anything tying me to this village anymore. I'll just use my San and travel rights, and there's nothing those old farts or that old freak Danzo can do to stop me from leaving. Jiraiya said, I take it that there is more to this than just Naruto dying. She turned to the window and said, ever since the news of Naruto's death these idiots have been celebrating. This is not the village that my grandfather founded. I can just see him and my granduncle rolling over in their graves so much that they wear through the wood in their coffins. Jiraiya nodded and said, good luck with that Tsunade. You know how the council will feel about a skilled shinobi like yourself leaving. Tsunade scoffed and said, I'd like to see them try. Like I said, they can't do anything thanks to my rights. Meanwhile in Kanoha's hospital, the Kanoha 12, minus Akura, Ino, and Sasuke, were gathered in Choji's hospital room. Naruto's dead. Choji asked from his hospital bed. The overweight ninja was hooked up to a heart monitor and a couple of IVs. He tried to move, but his muscles screamed in agony due to the red soldier pill he ate. It's hard to believe, Kiba said, wearing bandages on his body as well as his arm in a sling, he may have been a baka, but hell if he was a tough baka. To be honest, I always had a feeling that Naruto would outlive us. The guy was so too stubborn to die. Kiba had been forced to acknowledge Naruto's growth into a shinobi after the way he defeated him and Niji. His thoughts shifted to Akamaru who was currently at his family's veterinary clinic. Niji just sat off to the side, thick bandages wrapped around his shoulder, where an arrow had pierced his shoulder and stitches on his back where several kunai had pierced his back. His uninjured arm was clenched as he tried to keep himself from getting too angry. Troublesome, Shikamaru muttered as he glanced down at his broken finger, the only injury he sustained during this mission. The others all seemed upset. They may not have held Naruto in high regard, but they couldn't deny that it was upsetting. Lee felt tears run down his face as he felt anger run through his body. The most youthful Naruto had fallen in battle bringing back the traitor. He swore that he would live on in his friend's name, in the name of the boy who helped save his ninja career. Suddenly, the door opened and a member of Anbu wearing a wolf mask entered the room. He looked at the members of the room and said, for those who are not part of the Achiha retrieval mission please leave. We need to talk to the members of the team. In another room. Sakura and Ino sat while Sasuke laid in a bed, waiting for him to wake up. Sasuke had immediately been rushed to a hospital room to examine his wounds. Thankfully, to the fangirls anyway, he only had a few broken bones, minor lacerations, and was suffering from some minor chakra exhaustion. Well it seemed that the room was vacant other than the. Bam, Ino said, Naruto really did a number on him. Sakura scoffed and said, Naruto just got lucky. There's no way the dead last of our class could have beaten Sasuke. Ino nodded and said, yeah, you're right. I'm going to get something to drink. 
you want something? Sakura answered, water, please. The Yamanaka heiress walked out the room, closing the door behind her. There was a moment of silence. You are so pathetic, a voice rang in Sakura's head. Sakura sighed and thought, I thought I got rid of you. What do you want? Inner Sakura, a second personality that Sakura had, called as for short, said, why are you even doing this? You're sitting beside the guy who tried to betray your village after your other teammate died, are you really that shallow? Sakura thought back, I don't have to take this from you. As responded, well, you got me sister, too bad, so sad. Honestly, I thought that the whole mission to wave country would have been enough to knock you off your high horse, but apparently, you're too cocky to think that you can't be taken down. Sakura retorted, oh please. I was the Kanoichi of the year, and Sasuke was the rookie of the year. We are meant to be. He almost kissed me that one time, and we probably would be dating now if Naruto hadn't kept getting the way by constantly asking me out. His answered, yeah, and the fact that Sasuke seemed to be acting a little out of the ordinary, completely slipped your notice, Ms. Kanoichi of the year. And we both know that you only got that title because of your book smarts, which has gotten you nothing. Sakura was about to argue with her, but is cut her off. And before you start going on about what you've done, let's recap. During the bell test, all you did was run through the forest and fainted when you saw an illusion, and when you saw Sasuke buried up to his neck in the dirt. During the wave mission, you just stood by and guarded the bridge builder. If it were for Kakashi, Sasuke, and Naruto, you probably would have been cut in half by Zabuza and his helper. Sakura tried again, but has refused to let her get a word in. In the forest of death, you had to be saved by Rock Lee, Ino, Choji, and Shikamaru. Tree you stepped up, but you still had to be saved. You didn't make it to the finals while Naruto and Sasuke did. Then when Gara attacked you just wound up playing innocent bystander. Now that you think that you've had training from Tsunade that you're actually better. Sakura growled out, forgetting to speak mentally, I am better. His laughed and said, really, because you haven't really done anything except help at the last second, get saved and pretty much nothing else. Just face it Pinky, you're the dead weight of the team, not Naruto. As for Sasuke, he hasn't even given you so much as a glance, or any girl for that matter. Wake the hell up. But that is went quiet. Sakura growled in anger as he glanced at Sasuke's still sleeping form. She growled as she pushed down her doubts and anger as she focused on the task at hand. At that moment, Ino walked back in with the water, which Sakura took with a small thanks and drank. It will all work out Sakura thought, looking at Sasuke with an icy pit forming in her stomach, despite her willing it away, everything will all work out. Meanwhile in the Hyuga complex. Since she arrived home, Hinata had been crying in her room on her own. She heard several branch members trying to coax her out of her room, but she told them to leave, in her usual polite manner, and just wanted to be left alone. Hinata sobbed into her pillow. The boy who could inspire her was gone. The boy she had crushed on for years was gone. She looked back and cursed herself for her weakness. She always watched from afar and never really approached him, her nerves always getting the best of her. Hinata got up from her bed and walked over to the mirror. She saw herself. She saw the sorrow-filled eyes. Her tear-stained cheeks flushed from the amount of time she had spent crying. She glanced at the nearby mirror which sat on a dresser. Near it was a picture of her as a toddler, smiling happily, next to her mother, holding the recently born Hanabi and her father, with a true smile on his face, as opposed to the constant serious scowl he usually wore. Ach and Hanada thought, why did you have to go? Father and Hanabi both treat me so coldly. And now now this. Is everything I know going to be taken from me? Hanada's eyes became strong as she thought, no I won't fall into despair. For you for Naruto-kun I will become stronger, for him and for you. I've already started working on my own version of the gentle fist. Maybe I can talk to Gai-sensei and Lee about it. Given that they've trained Niji, they might be able to help me. The look of determination that almost rivaled Naruto's filled the child's wide eyes as she left the room to find the two members of Team 9. If she was looking at the image of her mother on the picture, she probably would have seen her mother's smile grow slightly. Meanwhile in a Megakur. Several figures stood around a large statue. There were eight of them all of them wearing black cloaks that had red clouds on them. The first was a male with onyx eyes that had long, pronounced tear troughs. His hair was jet black and was pulled in a low ponytail, and his face was framed with center parted bangs that extended to his chin. The cloak he wore had a high collar. Under the cloak he wore mesh armor with navy accents under an identical t-shirt, with a simple white belt around the waist and dark blue pants. On his right ring finger was a red ring with the kanji symbol for vermilion on it. Around his neck was a necklace that had three silver rings with red gems in them. On his hands you could see black nail polish, as well as black nail polish on his toes. On his forehead was a Konoha headband with a slash mark through the symbol. This was Itachi Achiha's rank missing nin from Kanahagakur and Slayer of the Achiha clan. 
The man next to him was by far the tallest, and he looked kind of strange. His skin was pale blue-gray with small round, wide eyes, gill-like facial marking under his eyes, giving him a shark-like appearance. If you could see under his attire you'd see actual gills on his shoulders. His teeth were sharp and triangular. His hair was dark blue and spiked up in the shape of a shark fin. On his fingers and toes were dark purple nail polish. There also a sash going around his body holding what looked like a club covered in bandages with a long light yellow handle with a small skull adorning the bottom of it. On his left ring finger was a yellow ring with the kanji for south. On his forehead was a Kurigakur headband with a slash through the symbol. This was Kisum Hashigaki, a former member of Kurigakur's Seven Swordsman and Monster of the Hidden Mist. Next to him was a medium-length silver hair that was slicked back and distinct purple eyes. He wore the black cloak with red clouds like the others. Under the cloak he wore pants and sandals. Around his neck was the headband symbol of Yugakur with a slash mark through it. He also had an amulet that had a symbol that looked like an inverted triangle in a circle. On his back was a large triple-bladed side with red blades that got smaller from top to bottom, a red shaft with bandages wrapped around the bottom of the long handle, a black cable that connected to the man's arm, going up his cloak sleeve. On his fingers and toes were dark green nail polish, and on his left index finger was an orange ring that had the kanji for three in it. This was Hyden the Jashin priest. Next to him was the second tallest of the was tan skinned, and he looked like a man in his prime given his muscular build. He wore a white hood and a black ask leaving his green pupils and red sclera eyes, wore the black and red cloak and a headband for Takigakur on his forehead with a slash through the symbol. On his fingers and toes he wore dark brown nail polish, and on his left middle finger was a dark green ring with a kanji symbol for north in it. This was Kakuzu. Next to him was a rather feminine looking man if his long blonde hair was anything to go by. He had slanted blue eyes, and his long blonde hair was in a half ponytail with the rest hanging down freely, with a bang hanging over his left eye. If you could see under that bang you'd see a scope. If you could see the palms of his hands you would see mouths on them. He wore the normal cloak. Under that cloak he wore a belt that had various bags of clay. He wore black nail polish on his fingers and toes, and on his right index finger was a teal ring that had the kanji for blue or green in it. This was Dadara, the mad bomber. The next figure was by far the shortest of them. He was hunched over with pale skin and a black mask. He wore a straw hat on his head with strips of white cloth covering his face. Unlike the others he didn't wear nail polish or ring. This was Sasori of the Red Sand. Next was the only woman of the group. She stood relatively tall with blue hair, amber-colored eyes with lavender eyeshadow, and elaborate piercing. In her hair she had a light blue paper flower and a neutral expression on her face. She wore the black cloak like the others and orange nail polish, plus the ring on her right middle finger with the kanji for white on it. This was Conan. Next to her was by far the strangest of the bunch. One half of him was completely black with a gold eye, while the other half was white with light green hair and a golden eye. Around his head was a large plant-like mouth like a Venus flight trap. This was Zetsu species unknown. The final member seemed to be their leader. He was of a respectable height. He had multiple piercings in his ears, nose, and lower lips. He wore the traditional cloak, a strange necklace around his neck, and on his right thumb was a purplish gray ring with the kanji for zero in it. He also had a necklace around his neck. What stuck out about him was his hair and eyes. His hair was orange and spiky. His eyes were purple with a black dot pupil and a ring pattern around it. This was pain. Together they were Akatsuki an organization of missing men. So the nine tails Jinchuriki is dead, pain said, his emotionless face. Isum let out an annoyed huff and said, damn, I hoping to get that kid. I wanted to go up against Kanoha's odd beast. Itachi just let out a huff. Looks like that little brother of yours is more of pain than we thought, Itachi, yee, Dadara said. Itachi just gave the mad bomber his usual poker face. Dadara was about to say something else when he was suddenly slapped over the head. A large metal scorpion tail slid back under Sasori's cloak faster than most could perceive, but they still saw it. Enough pain said. Though his voice didn't hold anger the power behind it cause everything to stop. It seems our plans are at an end, Payne said. Leader Sama, that might not be the case, Zetsu said, speaking in two tones, as he stepped forward. The leader of Akatsuki turned towards the plant man. We all know the Bijuu cannot be killed. We just need to wait until the Nine Tails reforms in a couple of years, the humanoid plant explained. Dissum groaned and said, do we really need to wait nine more years? This is crap. A small wave of killing intent from Payne shut the man up. Payne's purple and black ringed eyes held a small amount of annoyance and said, fine. Our plan will continue, but delayed. All members of Akatsuki then proceeded to vanish, revealing them to be nothing but holograms. Everyone except for Conan and Payne. After a brief silence the amber-eyed woman said, this was an unexpected happening. 
Bane turned to her and said, plans have delays or unexpected issues Conan. Even God has plans that lasted for centuries before they were complete. Bane then proceeded to walk into the darkness. Conan quickly followed. Meanwhile with Naruto. Kashina and Minato had fallen over laughing loudly. You mean, Kashina said as she gasped for air, you painted the Hokage monument in a kill me orange jumpsuit and nobody noticed. Naruto smiled at this and laughed, yep. The only person who caught me was Aruka sensei I still don't know how he did that. The two then fell over laughing again. Oh man, I would have loved to see that, Minato chuckled, tears running down his face. Off to the side, the Atsutsuki clan members were laughing maniacally. They had to admit it was hilarious. Ami, Tozi, and Shinigami all chuckled as they remembered the incident, being all-knowing had its advantages sometimes. It had been about an hour since Naruto arrived. Since then they had arrived at the place where they were staying. It was a rather nicely sized manor. There were a few rooms upstairs with enough room for the Namika's family and the Atsuki family. In the back there was a huge training area, no doubt where Naruto would be spending his time training. Since then Minato and Kashina were both bonding with their son. It was quite clear that Naruto still held some resentment to Minato, but they could work on that later. They had asked Naruto about what his adventures as a ninja. From the wave mission to the Chuanin exams, the two parents couldn't help but feel pride at how their son had managed to help so many people. They were annoyed however, when they learned about some of the other ninja of Konoha. Minato was even more disappointed in Kakashi. The young boy apparently had let that damn Sharingan eye of his go to his head, given the over a thousand jutsu thing. Minato shook his head as this was not the boy who he trained. The amount of favoritism shown was disgusting. Hell, it was the very same treatment that lead to Orochimaru. Ashina was thinking more along the lines of beating the tar out of the silver-haired hypocrite. Another thing that got them was how much the academy had degraded. They were popping arrogant pains left and right. One image was the idea of Kiba and Yuzuka. The boy's brash attitude and almost near inability to hold his tongue would lead to troubles for his team if it wasn't taken down. Hopefully Naruto's embarrassing defeat of him brought down his ego some. They were also appalled at the fangirls being produced in the form of Ino and Sakura. Two girls who dieted and didn't take any of their training serious unless it involved their crush. It made them wonder how they had survived so long. They also regaled Naruto with tales of their youth. Telling him about their times in the academy and what they had done when they were his age, as well as a few war stories from the ninja wars. Naruto learned he got his verbal tick from his mother and, apparently, go this dad's taste in women that being women with unique features. This made a lot of sense given his crush on Sakura. The partying mood went down after a while, and Naruto decided it was a good time to move on to a serious subject. So, Naruto said, I've been going through this, but can't figure it out. How exactly am I supposed to bring peace to the world? The feeling around the table became serious. First of all, Hagoromo said, we need to approach the major issues. First, you are going to have to take the remaining biju from the elemental nations. The Biju have been abused throughout history because of their power, and I will not see that happen again. The second will be the destruction of the Leaf Village, and finally the destruction of the Akatsuki. Naruto blinked and said, so the Akatsuki have to go huh? What about Itachi? Indra answered, don't worry Naruto, Itachi will be saved. As for uniting the ninja world I have a feeling someone may cause it unintentionally. Ashina then said, now, it's starting to get really late. We should get to sleep. We start training early in the morning. Everyone nodded and got up and went to bed. Naruto had changed into some pajamas and was prepared to sleep. For the first time in his life, Naruto felt like he didn't have to sleep with one eye open. The following morning. Naruto struggled to stay asleep as light flowed in from the windows. He groaned a bit as he tried to stay asleep. It was the first time in his life that he was able to sleep peacefully and damn if he wasn't going to enjoy it. Naruto rolled over in his sleep and snugged deeper into his pillows and almost went back to sleep. I say almost because a hand pushed his shoulder. Naruto, Kashina said as he pushed her son slightly, time to wake up. Naruto simply grumbled and pushed himself deeper into the bed, pulling the covers over his head. Kashina pulled the covers off, starting to get slightly annoyed with her son, refusing tear eyes from the world of dreams. Kashina then decided it was time to bring out the big guns. She left the room and returned a few moments later with a bucket of cold water in her hands. She drew it back and launched tea contents at a boy. Naruto let out a shrill cry as the ice-cold water struck him, instantly arousing him from his sleep. What the hell, woman? Naruto, now cold and soaking. Ashina said, that's what you get for not waking up when I told you to. Now get dried off and come down for breakfast. We have some things we need to discuss. Naruto sighed and nodded. Naruto got up and changed out of his wet clothes. 
after a large breakfast that was made up of bacon, eggs, waffles, apples, milk, and orange juice, Naruto was given his schedule for the training he would receive. 7 o'clock to 7.30 breakfast. 7.30 to 8 o'clock morning workout. 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock chakra control exercises. 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock to jutsu training. 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock jinjutsu training. 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock lunch. 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock ninjutsu training. 2 o'clock to 4 o'clock fuinjutsu practice. 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock dinner. 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock relaxation. 10 o'clock bedtime. After looking over his schedule Naruto felt a little nervous. That was a very long schedule, but knowing what his mission is supposed to be he knew it was going to be a very long few years. He sighed to himself as he finished his breakfast. 7.30 to 8 o'clock morning workout. Naruto now stood in front of his mother. She crossed her arms as she looked across from the boy. Okay, Naruto, the redhead said, we are going to work on your body. This will work you up enough for the rest of the training for the day. Naruto nodded in understanding. Now, Kishina said, drop and give me 50 push-ups, 50 crunches, 50 squats, and then run 5 laps around this training area. Naruto didn't move as he just stared at his mother with a shocked expression. Kishina narrowed her eyes and yelled, did his stutter. Move. Her eyes flashed red, and her hair raged like an octopus's tentacles. Naruto immediately dropped to the ground and started exercising. Shikamaru and Kiba were right. Moms really are scary. 8 o'clock to 10 o'clock. Kishina stood in front of her now exhausted child. The blonde was now doubled over and breathing very hard. Don't tell you're tired already, Kishina said, we've just gotten started. Naruto panted slightly tired because of the exhaustion of the warm-up that he had gotten. Now then, the woman continued, from what you told me you know chakra control up to the water walking exercise correct. Naruto nodded. Well, then we are going to improving on your normal chakra control, Kishina said as she motioned to the trees nearby. You see these trees? You are going to climb up them via the walking exercise. Naruto frowned and said, seriously mom? I can already do that. Kishina grinned and said yes, but this is going to be different. Each tree is of a different density. One eye rotting and other such different factors. If you ever touch the ground at the end of the training you will have to do that amount times 10 in push-ups. Naruto grinned and said, sounds easy enough. Naruto walked up a tree. He stood there for a moment before jumping to another tree. He held that for a moment before he realized his foot almost broke through the second tree's rotting bark. Oh, and one more thing Naruto, Kishina said as she looked up at her son, dodge. Naruto looked confused for a moment and asked, dodge. Dodge. Kishina then released a barrage of kunai. Naruto let out a cry of terror as he started dodging like crazy, trying to avoid the waves of weapons trying to pierce his skin. In the process of dodging he didn't apply the right amount of chakra and slipped off the surface of a tree falling to the ground. Naruto gave his mother a dirty look. Don't give me that look young man. She said sternly causing the blonde to wince. The rest of the first hour continued like this. After an hour, Naruto had to do 100 push-ups from the tree exercise. After the hour, they changed things up, going with a water walking exercise using a pool that formed in the ground. This time Naruto had to walk on water while the water was swirling. Naruto had some trouble with this, but he managed to get it done quickly. Unfortunately, the method didn't work long as the water would speed up and slow down at random intervals and Kishina was still throwing stuff at him. By the time the second hour was over, Naruto was exhausted. Thankfully, Minato was the one who took over his training next. 10 o'clock to 11 o'clock. To jutsu training. Minato stood across from Naruto with his arms crossed. Naruto looked slightly winded as this training was far more intense than what he was used. Okay, the older blonde said, Naruto I want you to attack me. Let's see just what you can do. Naruto nodded and charged. Minato dodged an overextended punch with ease. After a few minutes, Minato managed to get a feel for his son's style. If you could call it that. Naruto was more of a brawler than anything else. He used shadow clones haphazardly, only something in Yuzumaki could do to mob his opponent. Well a good strategy this could be a problem as the clones could get in each other's way if there were too many. Though he found that Naruto could think on his feet when he was duped by Naruto switching with a clone and a windmill shuriken flying at his head. Okay, Naruto, the older blonde said with a smile, I know your way of fighting, but it's time for you to learn how to really fight. This brawler style you use isn't going to cut it. So, follow me and do as I do. Naruto and Minato both got into a particular stance and they both started practicing. They went for the full hour before it was time to move on. 11 o'clock to 12 o'clock Jinjutsu training. Naruto now stood in front of Indra. The first user of the Sharingan stood across from Naruto. Okay, Naruto, the oldest son of Hagoromo said, what do you know about Jinjutsu? Naruto answered, mostly the basics. 
Bindra raised an eyebrow, and his Sharingan flashed for a brief moment. Naruto's eyes became blank, and then the blonde fell over unconscious. Bindra sighed as he walked over to the prone boy and smacked him over the head. Huh, who, what it in the where? Bindra sighed and said, this is going to take a while. 12 o'clock to 1 o'clock lunch. Naruto's stomach made a loud grumbling noise as he and the others all sat down around the table. There was a huge lunch filled with various foods, including ramen. After eating and getting a good amount of time digesting. Everyone went back to work. 1 o'clock to 2 o'clock ninjutsu training. Ashura stood across from Naruto as he stood up ready for training. So, Naruto what do you know about jutsu? Naruto thought for a moment and answered that it is the art of molding chakra through hand signs to launch attacks of various size, defend against other jutsu, enhance yourself, and other such effects. Ashura nodded and said, correct. Now what are the major affinities? Naruto gained a confused look. Affinities? Ashura rolled his eyes and mentally cursed the idiots in the academy before he said, Naruto, chakra affinities are the element a person's chakra is aligned to. This means they are more likely to use that kind of jutsu. Naruto thought for a minute and asked, so a person like Zabuza would have a water affinity, while someone like Sasuke would have fire and lightning. Ashura nodded and said, correct. Naruto then asked, so the main affinities would be fire, water, earth, wind, and lightning, right? Ashura nodded and said, yes, but there are two more affinities than just those. Naruto blinked and started asked, what? There are. Ashura nodded and said, there are. The other two main affinities are yin, which can be used to create anything from nothing, and yang, which can be used to give life. There are also sub-affinities which are normally seen as bloodlines that are two or more chakra natures mixed into one. An example being the first Hokage's wood release which was a mix of earth and water chakra. Naruto listened in awe and then stopped for a moment when he realized something. Wait I met someone a while back named Haku who could use ice techniques. Can that be made from mixing chakra affinities? Ashura nodded and said, yes, ice can be made by mixing water and wind chakra. Naruto blinked in surprise and said, so that means that all the elements can be mixed together. That's a lot of jutsu combinations. The founder of the Senju clan smiled and said, yes, there are. Now on to training Naruto I want you to perform the fireball jutsu. Naruto blinked in confusion and asked, what why? Ashura said, don't question your instructor. Naruto stepped away from his teacher and started to think about what he knew on the jutsu. He found it and went through the necessary hand signs. High release. Grand fireball. Instead of a large ball of fire, Naruto only launched a couple of sparks from his mouth. Aw oh, what? I did it right. Ashura stepped forward and said, Naruto, well you may have some knowledge of the technique you do not know its mechanics. Think of it like you've copied the jutsu with a Sharingan. Without knowledge of its mechanics you can't use it. Naruto sighed, slightly upset. Some of the jutsu he had seen used in his life were cool. However, the Atsutsuki clan member said, you do have an affinity for wind chakra. We shall start with that. For the remaining time, Naruto was trying to learn how to cut a leaf with his chakra. It was difficult as Naruto's control was still shot to hell after only one day of training. Two o'clock to four o'clock few injutsu practice. Naruto now sat at a desk with an inkwell, a pen, and a few dozen pieces of paper. Hagoromo and Minato stood behind him. Now, Naruto, Minato started, few injutsu is far more complicated than it sounds. For fully utilize a seal, it must be perfect. If even one mark on the seal is out of place the seal could fail in a spectacular fashion. Naruto blinked and said, it couldn't be that bad. Agoromo approached the child and said, Naruto, if I had been faulty in the seal I used to seal away the chakra of the Jaiwubi, the power would have torn me apart long before I died, and it would have gone on a rampage. Plus, if the seal on you was done even slightly wrong, you would have wound up like your friend Gara. Naruto winced as he remembered how Gara had been before his defeat. But that Naruto started to get to work. Unfortunately, Naruto had difficulty because his handwriting was horrible. Again, damn the academy or just lack of general education. Before Naruto could lean any few injutsu he would have to improve his handwriting until it was legible. 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock dinner. Naruto was exhausted, both physically and mentally by the time dinner came around. After eating his fill, he and his teachers began to discuss any changes that they would make to Naruto's training over time. 5 o'clock to 10 o'clock relaxation. Naruto spent the rest of the day relaxing up until bedtime. The blonde hit the bed falling asleep before he hit the pillow. A year flew by as Naruto trained with his family. The training was brutal and long, but the effects were astounding. Naruto's previous brawling style had improved leaps and bounds under his father's tutelage. Instead of brawling, Naruto had learned his father's hummingbird style. He was also starting to learn how to combine with the gentle fist used by the Hayuga. The combination of the two was a brutal style that could shatter bones and tear joints apart. 
The Atsutsuki family also taught him their own fighting style, the Imso no Ken, the Element Fist. The fighting style was a fast and brutal style with various stances that were based on the five elements. Fire was overpowering and aggressive, water involved countering and striking, wind was brutal and fast, lighting was accurate and fast, and earth was mainly for defense. Naruto had managed to learn the first four due to his own natural affinities. His chakra control shot through the roof under his mother's bizarre and very effective way of training. Naruto could stand on water for hours while reading and could do the same while tree walking. Naruto was currently learning how to suppress his chakra to make himself seem less visible if he was hiding. This would come in handy if he needed to vanish quickly as well as help him when it came to stealth training. On top of all that, Naruto learned a special skill most ninja didn't have. It turns out Naruto is a sensor type. This allowed Naruto to sense someone by directly sensing their chakra. Naruto's ninjutsu expanded several times over. During his training with Ashura Naruto learned he had five affinities. Wind from his father, water and lightning from his mother, and fire and yang from QB Naruto managed to grasp the basics of the elements, but yang chakra was trickier. He couldn't use it in battle because brining things to life didn't have a good use. While he didn't have an earth affinity, they did help him learn some of the low-level earth techniques he had inserted into his brain. Naruto was currently learning techniques from the sub-elements Scorch, Explosion, Lava, Oil, Radiation, Swift, Sand, Ice, Typhoon, Storm, Light, and Wave. He was even learning techniques for the Kekai Tota, Bloodline Selection, Maelstrom and Plasma. Despite the use of Shadow Clones, the training was still difficult, as he had to get the chakra proportions of the Jutsu right, or they would blow up in his face. And we meant that very literally. Naruto's training in Jinjutsu was also coming along nicely. Thanks to the enhanced chakra control, Naruto could now cast minor Jinjutsu, but still nothing too big because his control wasn't completely perfect. He could also sense Jinjutsu before he was caught in it. However, he was still unable to break the Tsukuyomi technique that Indra used. The slowest thing going around was Naruto's view in Jutsu training. The art of sealing was incredibly complex and gave the blonde headache sometimes. Shadow cones were proving useless as Naruto's head nearly exploded the first time he used it in his training. The training was coming slowly, but he was improving bit by bit each day. Aside from all of that, the goddesses would sometimes come down to help Naruto train with the gifts that they gave him. Tozi's gift came easiest, being able to speak to all kinds of animals. It was kind of fun to get someone else's point of view, and he could see how using normal animals as spies could be useful. However, they tended to give out a little too much information. In other words TMI. Kami and Shinigami's gifts were a bit harder for Naruto to understand, mostly because Naruto had a bad feeling about the whole playing god thing. He had seen plenty of movies and read a few stories where that kind of power always went wrong. He was getting a good grasp of it at least. He could heal and cause all kinds of wounds, though he mostly stuck with lacerations and large bruises. Instant death touch was not something he was fond of. Unknown to the blonde, he would have a chance to test out his newly formed skills sooner than he thought. Meanwhile on Earth in a small village in River Country. So, are we all aware of the plan? A figure asked as he looked over the group of four standing around. Four people, three men and one woman stood around each other. The one who spoke was a man with a slim face, a prominent jawline, a black line visible around his eyes, and brown swept back hair. On his back he had a white sword strapped to his back. On his forehead was a beige headband with a symbol on it that didn't belong to any of the five hidden villages. He wore a purple jacket over a black shirt and ninja pants and sandals. The only woman among the group had pale skin, dark green jaw-linked hair with yellow framing her face, and brown eyes that lacked pupils. He had red lipstick on her lips and wore a light gray jacket with a furry tuft around her neck with a light brown sleeveless shirt over a red sleeveless dress. She had a long light gray sleeveless leather glove on her right arm, a long light brown stocking that covered her left arm, with a single pitch black leather glove covering her right hand, and a forehead protector with the same symbol as the man who spoke with a white cloth. On her feet were two light gray calf-length high heel stocking sandals. On the left side of her jacket were two swords. Both of which had light blue handles, light blue blades, and gold guards and pommels. The only difference between the two was a green gem in the guard of one of the swords. The second male looked a little feminine. He was slender with green eyes that were outlined by blue eye shadow. His blue hair popped out from his white forehead protector and was neatly combed throughout his head. He had a white scarf around his neck that reached one to his pants. He wore a tight purple sleeveless shirt which revealed his abdomen. On his arms were purple arm warmers with brown straps that secured them onto his arms. His pants were baggy, gray, fastened by a brown belt and tucked into his sandals. On his back was a strange sword. It had a white handle with a yellow square-shaped guard. The blade itself was a dark blue color and was tri-pronged like a trident. The three blades also seemed to be segmented. 
The final man was by far the largest of the group. He was broadly built, indicating his strength. He had a purple coat under armor which was designed with a silver tiger-like head breastplate and a pair of dark pauldrons on his shoulders. His eyes had small black pupils and wavy brown hair with a small beard. In his hands he carried a mace with a square-shaped head that had spikes coming out of each side. In order, they were Hoki, Kujaku, Raigan, and Suko. They were members of Takumi no Sado, the village of artisans. To be more specific they were known as the four celestial symbols. The village of artisans had gone unknown, under the notice of the bigger villages. They had long since grown tired of being in the shadow of the five great villages, and they had a plan to rise up to the occasion. We know the plan, Kujaku said annoyed, when the Jinchuriki goes out of the village for the training issue we attack, drain his chakra, and use it to revive Seimei. I don't know why you're so worried. With our weapons we can get this done easy. Tsuko rolled his beady eyes and said, don't get full of yourself Kujaku, just because you were chosen to wield those swords of yours. My armor far exceeds your little knives. Kujaku laughed and said, oh really Suko? Shall we test that? The two were about to go at it when Hoki pulled the sword from his back and swung it down, sending an arc of fire from the blade slashing between the two. Once the flames cleared, the sword was revealed. It resembled a long sword. The blade was pitch black and rectangular shape. Like the blade the hilt and handle were black as pitch with white bandages wrapped around the handle and a green orb on the end of the blade. Enough. He yelled, all four of these great weapons will be needed to contain the one tails. Now get some sleep all of you. We'll need to be at our best for our coming mission. Kujaku and Suko glared at each other before parting ways. Raigan simply scoffed and started to walk away. Hoki sighed and rubbed his temples. Just one more day, he muttered, just one more day before you are revived Seimei Sama. Just one more day. He smirked as he glanced up at the moon. Soon the village of artisans will be given the respect it deserved. In a place between worlds. Shinigami, Tozi, and Kami both crossed their arms under their busts as they watched the incident through their all-seeing orb. What is it with humans wanting to bring people back to life? Shinigami complained, I mean enough people die as it is, and I have enough paperwork. Kami answered, hey, you think it doesn't affect me? I deal with the person coming to life unnaturally. Do you have any idea how confusing that is to certain departments? Why do you think we got rid of the reincarnation idea? Those he said, I think we have bigger problems the effects of people getting brought back to life on the departments of life and death. Ami nodded and said, yes, again the humans wish to use the biju for their own purposes. Plus, let's face it, they could become a problem in the future with their weapons, especially if Shukaku's chakra has a lasting effect on them. Shinigami asked, do you think Naruto is ready? Those he nodded and said, let's use this as a test. Our future husband needs to test his skills against people who aren't holding back. Plus, I think if he stays in the training area any longer he'll get some serious cabin fever. The trio of goddesses nodded. The teleported away. A few seconds later, they reappeared in the training hall where Naruto, his family, and teachers were staying. It seems they arrived at a good time as apparently the group had just sat down for lunch. Hey girls, Naruto said with a smile at the goddesses, what's shaking? The trio then explained the situation to the group. So, they intend to kidnap Gara and use the power of Shukaku to revive their master. Ami nodded and said, yes, and not only will a dangerous person be brought back to life, but the process will also kill your friend Gara. Naruto narrowed his eyes in anger. So, when do I go? Back on Earth. Tsuko, Raigan, Kujaku, and Hoki all stood just outside of the training area where Gara, his siblings and the group of young ninja hopefuls were training. Thankfully, for them, the trees kept them hidden, that along with some nice chakra suppression techniques, kept them hidden as well. Hoki noted that Gara seemed to be getting a little close to one of the students, a brunette girl, who was practicing with a rope dart. Oki grinned and said, okay, it looks like the Jinchuriki is getting close to that girl there. We grab her and then we'll draw the Jinchuriki to us. He nodded at Ryagan who pulled his sword off his back. With a smirk on his face he threw his sword out. The blue weapon shot out for several feet like a whip. The weapon wrapped around the brunette's ankle and dragged her off into the trees. Gara. This got the group's attention. Gar reached out with his sand, but the weapon tied around the girl's leg, sped up dragging her faster. The weapon then slithered up her body and wrapped around her tightly, preventing her escape. Hankuro, Gara, and Tamari launched forward after her. Gara launched his sand forward to grab her, but Suko leapt in the way, charging his mace with as much water chakra he could spare. He smirked and his flail swung at Gara in an overhead arc. Gara's sand acted immediately rose up and blocked the massive weapon. The wave of sand cracked under the force, but it didn't break. However, because of the water charka, the sand became saturated with water. Now clumpy and hard to move, a portion of Gara's sand was useless. 
Suko smirked at the reaction as he jumped back, just in time to avoid a barrage of kunai launched at him from Kankuro, who glared angrily at the man who attacked his brother. Kankuro sent out his puppet again, but this time it was intercepted by a massive blast of water. The blast launched a three-eyed puppet a tree just to the left of its puppeteer. Before Kankuro could reattach the chakra strings, he had to perform a substitution to avoid getting skewered by Dark Blue Blade. He was glad he did as the tree that was behind him got torn in half. As the blade retracted he found himself staring a rather pleased looking Ryugan, the capture genin behind him, tired in ropes. Ryugan then turned towards Gara, who sent out his sand to crush his opponent. The feminine looking man's blade became segmented and water came gushing out, stopping the sad. Now soaked, the sand became heavy, and Gara found difficulty using it. Get off my brother. The group turned towards the sound to see Tamari with her fan drawn and opened. Wind release. Wind cutter. The blonde swung her battle fan as hard as she could, unleashing a wave of wind towards the effeminate male who just attacked her brother. Immediately, Kujaku appeared with her swords. Wind return. As the woman swung her swords, the wind warped around it, much to the shock of the wind mistress in training. The bond quickly realized that her own technique was being used against her, closed her fan, and did her best to hold up against the skin-cutting winds as it slammed into her. The eldest of the Subaku siblings was knocked backwards into a tree. Gar growled as he rose up. Unknown to the four criminals, he had a small amount of sand grinding up the dirt around them to create more sand. When he felt he had enough, the sand erupted from the ground and smashed into Raigan and Suko, knocking them away. The red-haired sacrifice then grabbed the female genin and used his sand to propel them upwards, attempting to at some distance between them and to keep her out of the. Off to the side, Hoki, who had kept a good distance, nodded and knew that this was their chance. He stabbed his sword into the ground. Kujaku and Raigan did the same thing. Ninja Tools Barrier. Reverse Fish Scales Formation. Moments later, a massive wave of water erupted from the ground via the underground waterways. The water formed a dragon that slammed into the Gara, and Mitsuri were soaked to the bone. Worse yet, the force of the water was enough to tear off his gourd. Suko jumped up and grabbed the boy and threw a chakra-infused punch. With his sand armor loose and with his sand unable to protect him, the impact knocked the air from his lungs and nearly had enough force to knock him out. He proceeded to do the same to Mitsuri before launching them both towards the hidden Hoki. His grin down at the two before he vanished via Shushin. Damari got up with a groan of pain. Where are they? She asked angrily, what have you done with my brother? Tankuro got up and pulled out another one of his puppets. Who are you and what do you want? He asked with a growl, as his puppet was brandished menacingly. Tsuko just chuckled and said, who we are and what we want are interesting stories. Too bad you'll be too dead to hear it. The three got ready to finish off the two genin when something unexpected happened. I don't think so. Turning towards the sound of the new voice. They were also slightly confused as to who this person was. Judging by height he wasn't very old, maybe 14 or so. He stood with his arms crossed over his chest. He wore a black shirt underneath that had a collar that covered his entire neck with a short white jacket. Long black pants covered his legs, and he wore white boots on his feet. His face was covered by a pure white mask that covered his face. His hair was bright red and spiked out in multiple directions. On his hands were white gloves with studded knuckles. Behind his mask, Naruto smirked at their shocked expressions. Okay Naruto thought, now I just need to think of something really cool to say. Afternoon gentlemen, ladies, he said politely, his voice distorted by his mask as if he wasn't in front of a group of A-rank criminals. There was a moment of silence, save for a gust of wind blowing through the area. Damn it. Afternoon. Really. That's all I could think of I'm a pranking genius, I should be able to come up with a more memorable introduction. However, this wasn't what the three criminals were thinking. This guy had just snuck up on them and was just talking to them like he was speaking about the weather. This guy was either very arrogant or he was that sure of his skills. Dragon drew his sword and said, who are you supposed to be? The masked boy simply answered, my name isn't really your business, now is it? Kujaku scoffed and said, well, that's too bad. Now we won't have anything to write on your tombstone. She drew her swords back and prepared to swing, only for a sudden gust of wind to shot right in front of her. She turned just in time to dodge Tamari's now closed battle fan. The metal weapon struck the ground with enough force to crack it. Back off hag, Tamari growled, your fight is with me. Kujaku just smirked and she jumped back and ran off in one direction, Tamari following. Raigan launched his sword at the disguised blonde, only for a puppet to intercept it and knock it off course. The man growled as he turned towards Kankuro, who unleashed another puppet. The man jumped back and charged off into a different part of the forest, with Kankuro in hot pursuit. The disguised Naruto cracked his knuckles, and he glared at Suko. If you won't give your name, he said, I'll tell you mine. 
I am Suko, the White Tiger of the West. At least when you die, they'll know the name of the man who killed you. Naruto said, really? Because I think it would be more fitting on your tombstone than a eulogy. Suko sent a blank look towards Naruto before launching forward, swinging his mace. The disguised blonde dodged and threw out a hook punch, aiming for his face. Suko blocked the attack and countered with a punch to the ribs. Naruto blocked the punch, grabbing Suko's arm and pushed, knocking the man slightly off balance. Naruto then threw out a charka-infused punch, striking the armored ninja right in the chest. To Naruto's shock the impact didn't knock him back. Instead, his fist stopped against the armor. Naruto quickly felt like his chakra was being drained and leapt back. Suko smirked and immediately blurred through hand signs. Water release. Surging fangs. Suko fired a blast of water from his mouth which, surprisingly, took the form of a large tiger. Naruto quickly performed a substitution. The tiger tore through the log like it was made of paper as water splashed around, moistening the nearby dirt into mud. Suko growled as he realized that he didn't know where his masked adversary went. Off to the side, Naruto was hiding behind a tree, suppressing his chakra to avoid being detected. He glanced out from behind the tree. He saw Suko looking around for him. What the hell was that? I felt like my chakra was being drained when I punched him. I'm not familiar with that tiger jutsu either. It must be something they made themselves. This must have been what Sasuke dealt with when he fought that guy back in the Chunin exams. How does he do that? The only physical contact we had was from when I punched him. Naruto then leapt up from the tree branch and unleashed a barrage of kunai and shuriken. Each one was lined with wind chakra, increasing their cutting power and the blade length. Suko seemed to realize this. He went through hand signs as fast as possible. Water release. Water wall. The wall of water didn't stop the wind chakra enhanced projectiles didn't stop when they hit the water, but they did slow down enough for Suko to react. Focusing chakra through his weapon he spun the weapon like a propeller in front of him. The dense chakra enhanced metal managed to deflect the projectiles but left a few nicks in the staff. A mere second after the last one was deflected, Naruto shot forward through the wall of water with his fist drawn back. He sent his fist crashing into Suko's jaw, knocking him backwards. The man was sent flying back, rolling across the ground and kicking up dirt and splashing through some mud, as well as losing his grip on his weapon. Suko stopped only when he crashed into a tree, the impact rattling his brain, sending pain shooting up his spine and knocking the air from his lungs. Before the man could even realize what was happening, Naruto appeared in front of him, unleashing a barrage of short-range, fast-paced punches. The barrage kept him stunned and added damage, as well as causing damage to the tree behind him, the bark being chipped away at. Each one struck at his unarmored stomach and a few to the chest, shoulders, and his face. Naruto noticed that he felt small amounts of his chakra drain with each punch, but only when he punched the armored chest. So, the armor does drain chakra, but I have to come into physical contact with the armor. Good to know. Everything else is fair game. Naruto was ripped from his thoughts as Suko disappeared in a puff of smoke, replaced by his mace. Naruto's final punch tore a chunk out of the innocent tree that was behind the armored man. Naruto ducked to avoid a wild haymaker aimed at his head. Suko's punch tore a huge chunk out of the tree, causing it to fall to the ground. Naruto leapt away as Suko grabbed his mace which shifted into a flail form. With a battle cry, Suko swung the weapon. The chained weight came within inches from caving in Naruto's nose. The masked blonde slid back and dodged another swing, before performing a roundhouse that Sukio managed to block, but he winced under the force of the blow. Suko smirked as he grabbed Naruto's leg, which made the blonde smirk under his mask. The blonde then flipped up and then swung his legs up, using his chakra to enhance his strength throwing the man into the air. The blonde then slammed Suko on the ground with enough force to make him bounce. He then grabbed Suko's mace flay land, using his fire affinity, and reduced it to bits of melted metal. Suko got up with a groan of pain. He glanced and saw that his weapon was melted. He growled and turned towards the masked adversary who was interfering in their plans. As that happened, a massive explosion went off a few feet away. A massive wave of wind shoots up into the air, no doubt from the fight going on between Kujaku and Tamari. Another sound rang out as several trees were knocked over. Sounds like they're having a better time than me Suko thought as he stood up slowly. I can't waste any more time Naruto thought, I have to end this now. Naruto turned to his opponent and said, listen, tiger man, you don't have your weapon and I figure out your armor absorbs chakra when someone comes into physical contact with it. You can't beat me just give up. Suko groaned as he stood up. Suddenly, he grinned. Yeah, you figured out my armor and its flaw but you don't know what I can do with the chakra once I have it. Naruto raised an eyebrow behind his mask. Then he felt it. A massive amount of chakra buildup. A bright green glow came from the head decorating his armor and glowing brightly. This is the true power of my infinite armor. 
Suko said as the glow got brighter, now die. Tiger scream. A large blast of pure chakra fired out of Suko's chest, pushing him back a bit as it raced towards Naruto. The bright light blinded the man and prevented him from seeing his target be destroyed. When the blast faded, Suko fell to one knee. He let out a breath of relief as he stared at the resulting destruction of his ultimate attack. Several trees had been reduced to splinters, other had massive burns on them. He let out a tired sigh and slowly started to rise. He stumbled slightly. The tiger scream took a lot of chakra to perform. Usually, most people would attack him over and over without realizing their chakra was being drained, sometimes confusing it with natural use of chakra in battle. However, this guy figured it out quickly, which made him dangerous. It was because of that that Suko resort to the tiger scream, a powerful charka projectile that used the charka stolen from the victim. However, he could use his own chakra to power it if necessary, but as stated earlier, it took a lot of charka to perform. The man reached into his secret pouch in one of the leather straps and pulled out a few chakra pills and downed them. Feeling his strength return he stood up, a bit straighter. One down, two more to go. He turned to head off in the direction Kujaku had gone and when suddenly, the ground behind him exploded outwards like someone had thrown a paper bomb. He spun towards the sound and froze when he saw Naruto high in the air. Suko was confused until he glanced and saw that there was a hole in the ground, starting where all the brought on by his earlier technique. He had dug underground to get away. He growled angrily as he began to focus chakra in his chest for another tiger scream. With his target in the air, he couldn't miss. Naruto however, wasn't going to give him that chance. With a puff of smoke, Naruto performed a substitution with a shuriken that was discarded right in front of Suko. The symbol man gasped in horror as he saw a ball of chakra forming in Naruto's hand, releasing a small screaming noise as he drew it back. Wind release. Rasengan. The wind chakra enhanced spiraling sphere slammed into Suko's armor, right into the tiger's mouth. The buildup of chakra was suddenly force-fed a huge load of chakra, and with the amount of charka Naruto was putting into the Rasengan, it became unstable and exploded. The blast engulfed them both. When the smoke cleared it showed Suko had been launched a good couple of feet away. His armor shattered beyond use, and his chest had a nasty-looking grind mark from where the Rasengan had managed to get to him, though it wasn't as bad a regular wind-infused Rasengan. Naruto himself was relatively unharmed, but his arm had taken some of the blast, but the wounds and burns from it were healing already. Suko laid on the ground in phenomenal pain and feeling the life drain from him. H. How? He asked, as a bit of blood leaked from the corner of his mouth. Naruto simply scoffed and said, that armor of yours is formidable. However, it is not perfect. You might be able to absorb Charka, but you thought that I wouldn't catch on to what you were doing. As for your ultimate technique, that kind of chakra buildup can be unstable, which is why my technique was able to overload it and destroy your armor. Suko felt his life fading as he heard the boy's words. Did his armor truly have such a glaring weakness? That wasn't right. He then took a shaky breath, wondering how he had been bested by a masked nobody. It took a moment for Naruto to realize that Suko was dead. The blonde felt surprised, a small wave of guilt and disgust ran over him. The blonde gulped as he felt a small amount of bile begin to rise in his throat. After a moment, he managed to swallow the gunk building up and return to his work. He approached the dead man and prepared to take his armor. However, before he could it disappeared in a puff of smoke. Damn it, Naruto said out loud, a reverse summoning. At least with the armor busted, it should be useless to whoever has it. Naruto then closed his eyes, unseen behind his mask, before he unleashed a small chakra pulse to sense where everyone was. He could feel the fight between Kujaku and Tamari, judging by how low her chakra was she was running out and was not going to last much longer. Kankuro seemed to be faring a bit better than his sister, so Naruto decided it would be best to go to Tamari first. But that in mind he shot off towards them. With Tamari. Tamari panted hard as she held up her battle fan. Her clothes and skin were covered in multiple cuts. None of them were too deep, but they were painful. Around them trees had been uprooted by powerful winds or cut into pieces. This fight was proving to be much more difficult than the young wind user had originally thought it would be. The woman, who introduced herself as Kujaku, the vermilion bird of the south, turned out to be incredibly skilled with her swords to the point that she could keep Tamari on the edge. If that wasn't bad enough her swords, called the Fujaku Hishmshinken, weaknessless soaring short swords, as she called them, could redirect the wind jutsu she used. So far none of her techniques had worked so far. Fujaku laughed mockingly at Tamari, clearly gloating over the fact that she didn't have a scratch on her, as opposed to Tamari's injured form. It's been entertaining fighting you, she said with a smile, but I've been fooling around long enough. I think it's time that I just killed you. With that, she drew her swords back and laced them with chakra and swung her swords. Tempest wind. An enormous gust of wind went flying from the swords and went flying towards the young Chunin hopeful. 
Before the technique could hit, Naruto leaped out from the tree line burning through Hans' signs. Earth release. Great stone corner. The boy landed in front of Tamari and slammed his hands down on the ground. A stone slab that looked like the corner on a building erupted from the ground. The gust was split in half by the corner, protecting the two. The gust was still powerful enough to make a few of the surrounding trees bend with their force. She looked up and was surprised to see that the masked man from earlier. I take it you took down one of their own, she said, letting a small amount of relief fill her, but remaining slightly suspicious of the unknown man. Yeah, Naruto answered, the one with the armor. What can you tell me about little Miss Windy? Damari looked at him and answered, those swords of hers can freely manipulate wind, apparently with little chakra. She's even redirected my own techniques back at me. Naruto contemplated this and thought, okay, that means lightning jutsu is clearly out. Any water and fire techniques would be launched back at us more powerful than ever. On top of that I don't know any very effective offensive earth techniques. Come on think. Suddenly, one of the swords slashed through the stone slab with ease. The two blondes launched away from one another while avoiding another barrage of slashes from the sword-wielding Kinoichi. The woman smirked and said, HMPH, so you beat Suko, right? That brain-dead fool. It looks like I'll have to make up for his failure. While his armor may have been the ultimate defense, I wield the ultimate offense. She launched forward swinging her weapons. The blades laced with wind chakra. The swords were extended with wind chakra, making the reach much farther. Naruto knew this as he realized the slash had left an impressive size nick in his mask. The secret blonde grabbed the woman's forearm to stop her from swinging. She tried to stab him with her other sword, only for Naruto to grab that one too. He then threw out his leg, his knee impacting her stomach, knocking the air from her lungs. A second knee slam knocked her way and a roundhouse sent her stumbling towards Tamari. The pigtailed woman saw her chance and swung her closed fan, slamming it right into the woman's head. The impact knocked her backwards. Unfortunately, Kujaku recovered quickly and prepared a technique. Wind release. Phoenix breath. She swung her weapons, launching a projectile of wind charka that resembled a bird. Tamari jumped on her fan and leapt upwards avoiding the attack, which fell several trees. Tamari still in midair was a prime target as Kujaku drew her swords back to finish the girl, but in her haste to win, she had made a rookie mistake and completely forgot about her other opponent. Pay attention, will you Naruto said as he charged forward and hitting Kujaku in the throat with a light jab. Kujaku stumbled back, dropping her swords and clutching her throat. Naruto wasn't done as he shot forward with his pointer fingers extended and filed with lighting chakra. Lightning release. Paralyzing touch. Naruto then proceeded to unleash a volley of high-speed pokes. While this would seem like a joke to some, the pokes came with enough electricity to rival a stun gun. The electric charge numbed her body and strikes to her arms rendered them inoperable. Naruto then turned towards the sky and yelled, finish it. Damari jumped off her fan, biting her thumb and running some over the fan before swinging her weapon, calling out the ending move. Summoning technique. Quick beheading dance. In a puff of smoke, a giant white weasel wearing a black and red trim vest with a dark green eye patch going over one eye, holding a giant scythe with smaller sickles surrounding him as well a Chinese lantern with a symbol for scythe written on it. The weasel then began moved faster than the eye could track, slashing increasingly faster and faster with each passing second. Trees that weren't slashed down were cut down, and pieces of the earth and down trees were slashed to pieces. Gujaku got the worst of it as she was right in the middle of the whirlwind. She was knocked upwards her skin being cut up like paper. He screams of fear and pain drowned out by the fierce winds. As a particularly nasty slash mark appeared, she stopped screaming. The woman was suspended in the air for a few more moments before falling. The woman fell into the nearby river and was washed away. Damari smirked as the weasel she summoned vanished in a puff of smoke. Naruto turned towards her and offered her a soldier pill. The blonde woman looked at the masked man with a look of suspicion, but after a moment she took the pill and put it in her mouth. After a moment, she swallowed, not tasting anything bitter, which would indicate poison. Naruto glanced at the two swords on the ground as Tamari recharged and saw them vanish in a puff of smoke, just like with the remains of Suko's armor. Given that there weren't any pieces of metal around, it looks like she didn't get the big guy's armor Naruto thought, which means either the blue-haired guy has it or the big boss with my luck, the big boss. Who are you? Naruto turned to see Tamari looking at him with suspicion. I said who are you? She repeated, what are you doing here and why are you so interested in my brother? Naruto asked, is that any way to treat the person who just saved your life? Seems kind of ungrateful. Tamari said, I'm not saying I'm not grateful, but don't exactly trust you. How do we know that you won't just stab us in the back and kidnap my little brother when we're done fighting? Naruto sighed. He had expected this. 
given that many had tried to take her brother and use him as a weapon, she would be mistrusting of strangers or those who seemed to be helping them out of the goodness of their hearts without an ulterior motive. Naruto said, look, I don't expect you to trust me, but can you at least fight with me? At least until you and your brothers are safe. Damari simply cocked an eyebrow and asked, why are you helping us? Naruto answered, call me a concerned third party in this little conflict. Now do you want to keep questioning me, or do you want to find your brothers? Damari simply scowled at the boy, but was cut off from her contemplating when the sound of an explosion reached her ears, as well as the sound of trees being uprooted. That made her make up her mind almost instantly. Meanwhile. Ankuro stood out with on one of his puppets out. You would recognize the puppet at Karasu, Crow. On the ground, a few feet away, were the busted remains of his other main puppet, Karori, Black Ant. Ankuro had learned quickly that this guy, who introduced himself as Raigan the Azure Dragon of East, was a master with his unique sword, and he lived up to his name of the dragon. The trident-like sword could grow and extend and move on its own like a puppet and be used to tear through targets. It was that very same move that lead to be nearly destroyed. Raigan yawned and said, this has gotten boring. I think I'll just kill you now. He held out his sword and the blades extended in special segments. Water flooded out of the blades and formed a dragon head, one for each of the blade segments. Raigan smirked as he declared the name of his attack. Hydra. The three draconic heads launched forwards, all three of them ready to tear into Kankuro and stain their light blue teeth red. Wind release. Wind bullets. The trio of wind bullets shot out from the forest behind the puppet master in training, impacting the three dragon heads, causing them to burst into water. Ankuro turned and was shocked to see his sister and their masked ally. Raigan scowled and said, so you managed to defeat Kujaku and Suko. Oh well, I guess I'll just have to make sure those two learn what happens to failures later. I'll just have to take care of you three myself. Hydra. The water dragons reformed and launched forward the three ninjas. Kankuro and Tamari jumped to the left and right, respectively, while Naruto jumped up. Landing on the back of the head of the leftmost water dragon and rushed forward, running on the back of the dragon. Raigan looked shocked and slightly angry. Manipulating his chakra, the dragon head turned and charged at Naruto. Naruto, in response, launched forward even faster. Realizing what his opponent was doing, Raigan simply smirked. He quickly went through some one-sided hand signs and slammed his hand on the ground. Water release. Geyser wall. Naruto smirked as a large blast of water shot up from the ground, most likely from the underwater rivers. Normally, a person would be upset when someone did something like this. Naruto was smirking because this provided him with something that he needed. Hover. In a sudden puff of smoke, Naruto was gone and the water dragon splashed to the ground. The dry earth becoming a thick mud as water gushed through the trees. Tamari and Kankuro both jumped up, Kankuro taking his still damaged puppet. Raigan stared in shock, not believing what had happened, as the Garion sword fell with a splat down in the mud. The masked ninja had just performed a substitution with his weapon. The green-eyed weapon specialist was drawn from his shocked moment when a fist slammed into his chin with enough force to send him flying upwards and making him fall to the ground. He got up, now splattered with mud, and quickly engaged the disguised Naruto in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Damari stared in shock, not believing that such a risky maneuver had been shown. Doing so brought you into close range of your opponent and could leave you open to attack if you weren't ready. However, this guy used the shock value of the maneuver to his advantage. She glanced at her brother to see that he was still repairing his puppets, and by look of it, he was almost done. Getting an idea, she opened her fan and swung it. With a powerful blast of air, a good amount of mud shot out and towards the fighting pair. Naruto, who was now grappling with the man, saw the incoming projectile and quickly disengaged, throwing the effeminate male towards the incoming muck. The moistened earth splashed against the man's face, blinding him. To add to his disorientation, Naruto moved behind him and clapped his hands over his ears. But the smirk, Kankuro finished his repairs and launched his two puppets. The boy launched Karasu, which opened up and trapped the disoriented ninja. As he banged at the wooden interior, Kuromi broke into pieces its arms and head floating above the middle of the bird named Puppet, with points aimed at the holes in the puppet's hull. Kankuro smirked before he made a motion with his hand. Secret lack technique. Iron Maiden. The separated limbs and head of Kuromi shot into the holes in Karasu. The sound of beating stopped as a familiar red liquid began to drip out of the holes. Naruto held a small amount of bile down, still not entirely used to the idea of death. However, he managed to swallow it and handed another soldier pill to the puppeteer, who, after getting the okay from his sister, took and ate it. Glancing over at the Garion sword, Naruto saw it vanish in a small puff of smoke. So now the boss has the two weapons we've seen so far, a busted piece of armor and whatever weapon he may have. This is going to be a problem I can tell. 
That's three out of four, Tamari said, now we just need to find Gara and their leader. Naruto discreetly sent out a pulse. Immediately, he felt the chakra signatures of Tamari and Kankuro, even the small amount of fading chakra from Raigan and Kankuro's puppets. After a few moments of searching he managed to find what he was looking for. He managed to find them. He couldn't make out Gara, but he could make out the forms of the capture Suna Kanoichi, whose name he didn't know, and the unnamed leader. However, what got his attention was the dome structure nearby. He could feel a familiar chakra. He could also feel that the One Tail's chakra was steadily growing stronger as Gara's chakra slowly diminished. As Naruto was trying to figure out where they were, Kankuro began to talk to his sister. So, who is this guy anyway, he whispered, trying to avoid being heard. I'm still not sure, she said, it's pretty clear that he's here to stop these four psychos. He managed to take down one of these goons single-handedly. Not to mention, he saved me from one of that hag. I think he is on our side, but we should keep our guard up, just in case. The puppeteer nodded. As he has saved them, they were willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. If it looked like he was going to turn on them, then they would act. I found them, Naruto said, gaining the attention of the two siblings. Before they could ask, the disguised blonde shot off. Immediately, the siblings launched forward and ran after him. The path they followed lead them to the edge of the forest, at the base of a cliff near a canyon. They found the final member standing there. As true to Naruto's sensing abilities Mitsuri was tied up a few feet to the right, while to the left, there was a large metal dome a few feet away. Kankuro and Tamari were quickly able to deduce where Gara was. And judging by how the dome was starting to glow, they didn't have a lot of time. The man just glared at them as frustration started to fill him. The three pests had completely messed up their plans. His three teammates were dead, and the infinite armor had been completely busted. He would be lucky if he could scavenge some of the remains. Not to mention when Seimei was revived, he would be displeased to see that one of his greatest creations had been completely ruined. You pests have gotten in the way of our plans, Hoki said, in an eerily calm tone as he reached behind him. Out from behind his back he pulled out his sword. However, it had changed dramatically. The large rectangular black blade had apparently been combined with the Garion sword and the Fujaku Hishmishimken. The handles had all fused. The blue three-pronged blade of the Garion sword had fused into the blade of Hoki's sword, the middle tip ending just under the green orb at the top. The blades of the Fujaku Hishmishimken had merged into the sides of the blade. With this I will end your interference with my plans, he declared, a glint of madness appearing in his eyes, I am Hoki, the black tortoise of the north, and I am going to be your destruction. He swung the sword, releasing a wave of white red tipped flames right at them. The group leapt upwards, landing in the higher branches of the trees. The flames blackened the earth, burned the grass, and reduced a few tree trucks into firewood. In the trees, the three ninjas quickly moved from tree to tree to avoid the potentially rising flames, the falling trees, and potential smoke inhalation. The Mari quickly leapt backwards to avoid the flames and swung her fan. The powerful gust that picked up dirt, dust, ash, and fire. The burning cloud was launched toward sword-wielding maniac. The man simply smirked at the assault and swung his sword. This time, it was a massive wave of water that smashed into the cloud, busting through it, cooling it down, and sending it straight towards the blonde Kanoichi. The blonde quickly performed a substitution, replacing herself with a log to avoid the wave of water. Then Kuro unleashed Karasu and Karomi upon the swordsman. He smirked as the two weaponized puppets closed in on the man. Oki simply raised his sword and stabbed it into the ground. The cock whirlwind. The twister formed around the man leader of the falling group. The puppets were struck with a massive wind, inflicting massive amount of damage. Kankuro managed to pull back his puppets before they were reduced to splinters, but he was quick to notice just how badly they were damaged. Naruto saw this and realized that with all the weapons combined, Hoki could manipulate water, wind, and fire. It also made him very glad that he made sure to smash the armor the Suko was wearing. He glanced over to the dome and could feel the Gara was about to run out of enough chakra to keep the one tails at bay. He had to make a move and now. Thinking quickly, the disguised blonde went through various hand signs. Water release. Hidden mist. Almost immediately, a thick mist began to form. The mist became so thick it was hard for anyone to see. Naruto quickly began to suppress his chakra to help hide himself. It also helped that the mist was laced with chakra. After a quick familiar hand sign two shadow clones appeared and ran off into two different parts of the mist. One clone was to provide support while another was to maintain the mist. The Mari and Kankuro were both on edge. They knew that in the mist they were nearly helpless. The two siblings were now back to back, ready in case their mysterious ally decided it would be a good idea to betray them. Oki laughed, you think your little parlor trick will be able to stop me. He performed the peacock whirlwind again, only for the mist to come back in full force a moment later. He tried again, adding more chakra, for the same effect. 
he was now really starting to get frustrated. In his frustration, he didn't notice the original Naruto go towards the dome and focus a mix of fire and wind chakra into his pointer and middle finger. He placed it against the metal dome and slowly began to move it. He was slowly burning through the metal, using the fuse chakra like a blowtorch or a welding iron. Inside of the dome, Gara saw the light and could feel the chakra. He started to move towards it. Right now, he could feel the chakra of the one-tailed beast rising, and he could hear the beast ranting and raving at him in his mind. Meanwhile, Hoki was mentally ranting and raving about how the Sand siblings and the others wouldn't get in the way of his plans. How Seimei would be revived and the Takumi village would be revived as the strongest in the elemental nations. As he was ranting, he didn't notice Naruto, in stealth mode, sneak up behind him and grab Mitsuri. The girl looked about ready to scream, but a quick motion silenced her. She was pulled away from the madman and hidden in the mist. As the hostage was taken away, the madman snapped. That's it. I've had it with you fools. Taking his sword, the man focused as much chakra as he safely could and swung it as hard as he could. The massive wave of wind chakra pushed away a good portion of the mist, revealing those hidden within it. Oki's eyes widened as he saw that his hostage was now gone and became enraged when he saw that Naruto was about to break through the dome. No. No. Get away from there. Oki swung his sword, this time launching blades of ice at the original Naruto, who had almost gotten through the dome. Kankuro and Tamari both acted. Kankuro threw out his hands launching chakra strings laced with wind chakra, slicing through a few of the ice blades, while a blast of wind from Tamari's fan knocked back the remaining blades. Oki was about to swing again, only this time, the shadow clone that saved Mitsuri intervened. He launched forward and slammed a kick into the still raised sword, knocking Hoki off balance. A swift barrage of impacts to the solar plexus, stomach, temples, and jaw, incapacitated the madman. To add on, the clone that had been holding the mist quickly went through hand signs for a technique of his own. Boil release. White snake. The remains of the mist went together and began to heat up, turning into steam. The hot steam then launched forward and slammed into sword-wielding maniac. A loud scream of agony was ripped from Hoki's throat as a massive amount of pain ran through his body as the hot steam burned his skin, leaving bright red marks. The clone that engaged Hoki in combat turned towards his brother and gave him a thumbs up before vanishing in a puff of white smoke. The clone crossed his arms with a smirk under his mask and vanished as well. Naruto lifted Gara up and smiled at his old friend from behind his mask. He quickly took out an enhanced soldier pill and gave it to the exhausted redhead. Gara looked at the masked Naruto, then at his siblings who nodded. He swallowed the pill and felt some of his strength return. He nodded gratefully at the man who had saved the lives of him, his siblings, and of his student. Gara. Gara soon found himself embraced by Mitsuri. Over to the side, Hoki glared angrily at the group. All his plans, all that work, all for nothing. He snarled angrily as he fraught the pain of the esteem burned skin and slowly reached for his sword. I, I won't let it end like this. Lord Seimei will be revived. If I can't do it here, I'll find some other way. But first, I'll have to take care of these meddlesome pests. But the roar, that was a combination of anger and pain, Hoki raised his sword and prepared to swing. Naruto, however, acted quickly. Swift release. Shadowless flight. Naruto disappeared and reappeared in front of Hoki, almost instantaneously. Hoki froze as he what happened. Naruto acted quickly and unleashed the finishing blow. And sightless impacts. The barrage of instantaneous punches slammed into the sword-wielding maniac with bone-shattering force. Hoki screamed in pain as bit of blood came out of his mouth, the pain of his burns now multiplied by his now shattered ribs. The barrage was so powerful, Hoki was launched into the cliff, letting go of his sword, which fell to ground and separated into separate swords again. Hoki impacted the canyon wall with an insane amount of force. A large crack formed in the wall, making it crumble. Hoki's dying screams were all that was heard before he was crushed beneath the falling rock. Naruto glanced at the cliff and felt a small amount of bile rise in his throat for the second time during the mission. He had felt the ribs shatter under his fists and immediately felt sick, like when he had killed Suko. He managed to swallow his bile after a moment or so before turning to the swords. Reaching into his coat, he pulled out a sealing scroll and sealed the weapons, he even sealed away the remains of the infinite armor, figuring that they might be able to get something out of the armor. Naruto then turned to take his leave. Wait. Naruto turned towards Tamari who had shouted. The Suna ninja had just fought through four maniacs and nearly gotten killed, only to be saved by the timely arrival of some mysterious masked ninja. None of them believed in divine intervention, and they wanted answers. Who are you? Naruto turned towards his old friends and answered, I'm just someone who was passing through. With that, Naruto vanished in a blur of speed, leaving four very confused ninjas in his wake. Damari's eye twitched as she didn't get any answers. 
Kankuro, Gara, and Mitsuri both scooted away from the blonde girl before she let her displeasure known. The just raises more questions. A few hours later, at Naruto's training home. When Naruto returned home, he found everyone there, ready to congratulate him. Kishina even went so far as to make her own super ramen for Naruto, which consisted of chicken, pork, and beef, all mixed together with specifically made veggies, thick noodles, and a specially made secret recipe broth. Despite this, Naruto didn't seem to be at the top of his game all night. He tried to put on a happy face, but he wasn't fooling anybody. When it was time for bed, Minato and Kishina decided it was best that they have a talk with their son. As Naruto was getting into bed, he was surprised to find that his father and mother entering his room. Naruto is there something bothering you? Kishina asked as she took a seat on her son's bed. Naruto looked at her and his father, both having concerned looks on their faces. Naruto sighed and said, is it always like that? Killing people. Minato answered, Naruto the first kills are always the same. You feel sick and you think yourself a kind of monster. Well it's not pleasant, it is necessary in certain situations. If you hadn't Hoki and his associates would have tried again, and it might not have gone so well. Not to mention, if they did manage to resurrect that same A guy, we don't know what would have happened. Kashina nodded at her husband and said, like he said, killing isn't pleasant, but it is necessary in our line of work. Kashina embraced her son. Naruto was surprised, but embraced his mother. Minato got in on the action, embracing his wife and son. As the family held each other a sense of relief filled Naruto. Naruto had just grown up some and was glad that he had his parents back. Thanks for watching, hope did you enjoyed this video if you do please leave a like share and subscribe. Also don't forget to check it out author of this fanfiction. Take care.